Good morning and a very warm welcome to um, the committee members and the public to the 30th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee. Can I remind everyone present to please turn their mobile phones and other devices to silence so they don't interfere with the broadcasting. Our first agenda item this morning is a decision on taking business in private and uh, ask the committee to consider whether the we will consider a draft report on music tuition in schools inquiry in private at future meetings and whether its consideration of its work programme should be taken in private at the next meeting. Is that agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two is our final evidence session on our music tuition in schools inquiries. And we have two panels of witnesses today. Um, uh, roughly about an hour for each one, so we're quite tight in time, so if people could be concise, that would be very helpful. Um, before we move to the first panel, I would like to put on record the thanks to everyone who has given evidence to the committee so far, including most recent correspondence from the National Youth Orchestra of Scotland, which was circulated this week to members. Our first panel today consists of representatives from COSLA and me. I welcome to committee this morning Councillor Stephen McKay, Children and Young People Spokesperson, Eddie Folan, Policy Manager, Children and Young People Team, and Lauren Bruce, Chief Officer, Local Government Finance at COSLA. And uh, we're delighted that you've come to, to be with us this morning and understand that Councillor McKay, you'd like to make an opening statement. Yes, thank you, convener. It's uh, nice to be back again. I see some familiar faces and some new faces since I was last here. Um, as the committee will be aware, the issue of instrumental music tuition has been discussed at the COSLA Children and Young People Board, and we have written to the committee on the decisions taken on a cross-party basis by the board. We can no doubt discuss those decisions in more detail this morning, um, but before we go to questions, I thought it would be helpful to give some context to both the role of COSLA as a membership organisation and also the financial constraints in which local authorities are currently working hard to deliver essential services. COSLA represents the 32 local authorities, and as a membership organisation, we represent their views. We cannot tell them what to do or take action to either change or rectify what they do. What we do is to seek to achieve consensus of approach while recognising that local authorities will make decisions based on a wide range of factors. And then an absolutely vital element of our approach is that we respect and protect the ability of councils and their elected members to make decisions based on local priorities. In seeking political consensus, we work through our various boards and we have achieved this on many complex issues from education reform to the expansion of early learning and childcare. On instrumental music tuition, there is a very strong consensus that this is a valued service, has an important role in education, and that to maintain the service in very difficult financial circumstances, retaining the option of charging is crucial. Since 2011-12, core funding to local authorities has been reduced by £1.64 billion in real terms. No local authority makes the decision to introduce or indeed increase charges for any service lightly. However, the financial situation for local authorities continues to be very difficult, and as a consequence, councils have faced difficult decisions about funding. Our board were absolutely clear that these decisions are the embodiment of local democratic process and as such decision making and accountability for those decisions rest locally. In the context of respecting local decision making and an extremely challenging financial situation, we are making every effort to ensure there is access to music tuition for those in the lowest incomes, those sitting SQE exams. And through that guidance, we will improve the communication between authorities and children, young people and parents, on the reasons and the rationale for charging and the transparency around decision making. Officers will take forward this work and, and guidance over the coming weeks, and we will report back to the board in February. I'm happy to obviously take questions from members, and I'll bring officers in where appropriate. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Councillor McCabe. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Ian Gray first. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, um, Stephen. Um, you, spoke, you spoke there about uh, a consensus of approach, because I'm finding a consensus of approach on this issue, but the evidence the committee has heard is that the result of that consensus combined with 
local democratic decision making is a huge variation in uh, the availability and cost of instrumental music tuition. Do, do you think is COSLA content that in one part of Scotland instrumental music tuition should be free and another it costs a family many hundreds of pounds? COSLA respects decisions making by democratically local councils who are accountable to their local electorate for those decisions. It's not COSLA's role to impose a national policy on our councils. You had the opportunity at the previous session of, of the committee to speak directly to three councils, all who take a different approach. Mm -hmm. COSLA respects their different approaches. In fact, each of those three council representatives reported back to the last meeting of our Children and Young People Board and set out their council's particular position. And across the country, from, from Shetland to, 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 to Dumfries and Galloway, there was absolute consensus that the principle of local democratic decision-making and accountability is something that we fundamentally guard and want to protect. But, but you also said, uh, Stephen, that COSLA believed there should be protection uh, for the capacity of children from less well-off families to access instrumental music uh, tuition. But again, the evidence the committee has heard that although there are in, in most authorities schemes, for example, for families who are children who are entitled to free school meals to access music tuition, that there are significant numbers of families or sections of the, the population who do find that it's not possible for their children to continue. So you've got the example uh, from last week of West Lothian, where the introduction of charges is seen uh, in primary schools. Four-fifths uh, of children drop out of, of instrumental music tuition. There's the evidence of John Wallace from the Music Education Partnership Group, quite clear uh, the people who have have more, the people in more deprived areas have less. So, so are you content that the situation is actually delivering for those children from poorer families. COSLA is here to represent the views of our members. Our members have discussed this issue and at the last meeting of the board, the consensus was around the fact that there should be no charging for SQA exams and I think that is the case across the board and that every authority should, should uh, seek to provide free tuition to those children entitled to free school meal and I think that was agreed unanimously across the board. That would be the minimum criteria we would build into any, any guidance. But it would be for councils to decide if they were going to introduce other policy means that meant that uh, families who weren't entitled to free school meal but were perhaps in low pay would, would, would potentially get uh, a reduction in charges. Our view is that should be a decision for local democratic ele uh, elected councils. And you can't look at decisions that councils have made on music, musician, music charges in isolation. I'm sure when the councillors of West Lothian or indeed uh, Perth and Kinross, uh, who have charged for a long number of years before uh, West, West Lothian, sat down and reviewed the savings proposals they were presented with, I'm sure that they agonised for hours over making those decisions probably. I'm sure that they consulted as part of their budget process, their local electorate, and I'm sure and confident that in their view, in their value judgments, introducing a charge for music tuition was a less damaging saving or cut, if you want to give it its proper term, than something else. It may well be the case that other councils have decided otherwise because they've made a, a different judgment. I, I as a a council leader sit every year with a whole list of savings proposals presented to me by officers and to other elected members, and we have to go through that agonising list of tortures, weeks and weeks and hours and hours of discussion and reviewing before we make decisions. I'm sitting with I'm sitting with a list of nine million pound savings in front of me for for next year potentially, and some of the, those involve education. And the reality is, if you don't take hard decisions in one area, you take hard decisions in another area. And the fundamental issue is not about ring fencing funding or protecting services. It's about the chronic underfunding of local government over the last 10 years, which this parliament has presided over. So is it fair to say then that the, the differing structures uh, and provision of instrumental music tuition and the charging regimes are driven almost entirely by 
financial constraints on local authorities, that they are financial decisions that these local authorities have had to take and they've taken different ones. Is that, is that fair? I, I think that's very fair. I mean, I, okay. I've been a, 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 an elected politician for a, a long number of years. I, I, I am no way musically inclined in any way. Um, music, music passed me by. But I like nothing better than, uh, as I'm going to tomorrow night, going to our schools concert in Greenock Town Hall and, and seeing the, and listening to the, the, the concert bands and the orchestras and the, and, and the vocalists and, 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 and look on with pride with the, 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 the passion that those young people enjoy their music and the, the joy that they give to people who are listening. And our concert bands and, and, and uh, orchestras have went across the country representing our council and achieved huge rewards and brought huge credit in our authority. And I believe every elected member has, has a passion. But we also have a passion for many other areas, including tackling poverty and deprivation and, and a whole range of other challenges that we face as a council. And this, in my opinion, is entirely driven by the hard, hard choices that councils have to face. I would like music tuition to be free to every young person in Scotland, in the same way that many other things are free to every young person in Scotland. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, councils are faced with hard, hard decisions every year around education, around every other service that we, we have. And we cannot sustain what was previously free. We cannot sustain it indefinitely. My, my, my council has, has a fairly limited approach to charging, but we've made other hard decisions. So I wouldn't criticise a council who've cut back or introduced charging music tuition, because I may well have taken other decisions in other areas that, to protect music tuition. And, that, and that's the simple fact of the hard choices that we face. Okay, you've kind of touched on this, but I, I just wanted to explore this a little bit more last week uh, when we had the representatives from three different councils who've taken three very different decisions uh, around uh, charging for instrumental music tuition. Um, it was suggested to them that one way out of this would be for central government to provide the funding to allow these, uh, this tuition to be provided free. Um, all three of them were quite reluctant to do that. I, I think the committee might feel that if uh, local authorities are genuinely passionate about the opportunity provided by music tuition, you've just described that yourself, uh, Stephen, then why would they resist central funding in order to make, uh, make this something which was available free across the board? Local authorities will always take pragmatic decisions in the best interest of their communities. So if, if the offer of money was on the table, they would look at that and, and see, say what was in the best interest of, of their community. So if we have a, a recent example uh, of um, the level of school clothing grant, so huge lobbying around that, huge pressure on the government, and the government decided we'll come up with extra money for school clothing grants. Um, the, the, the level was not determined in legislation, so there was a huge variation across councils, but the, the government said, we'll come up the money so that everybody can bring the, 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 the level up to a minimum of £100. Some councils were already above £100, some were significantly less than £100. Again, potentially you could see that as overriding the, the principle of local democratic decision-making, but we took a pragmatic approach. We said, fine, if the government comes up, we'll work with them on a voluntary basis and we'll, we'll come to agreement, and, and we did that. But these sticking plasters, and I think that's how we would see them, are continually applied. So you have somebody who raises a good cause, who lobbies, who introduces a petition uh, and says, isn't it terrible that this thing is happening in local councils, this council's cutting this and that council's cutting that, and wouldn't it be better if we just funded it centrally and the government comes up with money in there and comes up with money here and money there? Applying sticking plasters. The fundamental problem is the chronic underfunding of local government. And I've given you the figure, and, and Lauren is our finance expert, and if anybody wants to challenge Lauren's figure on that, we're more than happy to have, have, have that discussion. But the fundamental reality, it's, it's absolutely the chronic underfunding of local government. Yeah, we're prepared to have a dialogue and a discussion around the area of finance, but let's be clear, it costs, I think we've estimated, £28 million a year to provide music tuition. Fees and charges, which aren't applied by every council, raise somewhere in the four million. And next year, it'll cost more than 28 million. It'll cost more than 28 million a year after a year after that, because basically inflation, wages going up, etc., will continually rise. So we think simply saying, fine, four million pound, 
to wipe out the charges is a very simplistic solution to it. I don't believe any council in Scotland in an ideal world, if they had the right resources, would want to charge for music tuition. But just to be I will try and sure, bring you back absolutely. in, but we, we, yeah. re we are really tight for time. So I'm going to bring in Dr. Allen in. Well, thanks very much. Um, I just want to ask um, a question I've asked other witnesses, really, which is um, whether you feel that local authorities across Scotland are, are now living up to undertakings that were given six or seven years ago on the back of the, the government's working group on instrumental music tuition and some of the some of the some of the agreements essentially that were reached about what would and wouldn't be done in the future? I, I'm not conscious that local councils have breached any uh, agreements which were reached before, but I'll bring Eddie in on that particular point. Yeah, I mean, that's the, 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 the review um, and the recommendations from that. Um, and I think in our response, in our letter, we, the, the last time we visited that was 2015. Uh, and in 2015, we'd, certainly the progress had been made, and I think we would want to kind of go back to that as we're doing the guidance, because on, in the guidance we would look back to whatever those recommendations were and make sure that we're trying to kind of address those. So um, I think progress has been made in, in a number of areas in the guidance, uh, in the, with, with the review, um, but we, I, think, I think we can still do more than 17 recommendations, and I think that there's, there's more can be done, but we we'll certainly revisit that as we're developing this guidance, which we're doing at the moment. Thanks for that. I mean, it certainly was interesting speaking to students from the, the Royal Conservatoire whose, whose strong view seemed to be, and I'm not putting words in their mouth here, but their, their strong view was that some of these undertakings weren't being lived up to, and, and particularly um, around, let's say, definitions of how you live up to the undertaking that was given not to um, introduce fees for, for tuition that leads up to SQA courses. So I, I just wonder if on that one specifically you feel that local authorities are actually introducing fees now for for courses or for tuition rather which is essential to get to an SQE exam? Well, I think our, our view is no. <coughs> well, I mean, my, my understanding or our understanding is that there are no charges to parents uh, or families for SQE. Okay, and, and, and finally, again, on, on the back of what the, the conservatoire, students, conservatoire students were saying, um, I just wonder what kind of uh, workforce planning is being done by local authorities. I mean, they, one of the, the points they were making to us very strongly is they, they can't see where the next generation of music teachers is going to come from um, unless there are a supply of people um, who are sufficiently uh, adept in musical instruments to get to a point where they can go through the necessary training to become music, music teachers. And again, I come back to my point, which is uh, that they, they raise doubts whether the, the tuition uh, now available uh, in many parts of Scotland is, is sufficient to get to, for instance, a, an advanced higher in music. Um, I, I, mean, I mean, there are, I, I suppose that in the wider context, there are, the, 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 we're looking at, at, at shortages of teachers and there are pressures on on local authorities there, and I think I think there will again there will, there will be variability um, in terms of supply of teachers in particular areas. So I, I, I think it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge that we need to look at, and and we're happy to kind of take that on board. Thank you. Ms. Okay, Ruth, you wanted to quickly think. supplementary with regard to Ian Gray's line of questioning. Um, I hear what you're saying, Councillor McCabe, with regard to local democratic accountability, but I wonder about the issue of exemptions because the committee has heard variations across the country in terms of exemptions. So in, in certain local authorities, free school meals, for example, will be used as a measure. Um, sibling discount might apply in certain local authorities, but not in other areas. <laughs> I wonder, therefore, if COSLA might take a view with regard to exemptions nationally so that there should be at least a level playing field in terms of exemptions? As I said earlier, that, that particular issue has been discussed at our board, and our board have been quite clear. And our, our board comprises the education spokespersons for the 32 councils, and our board have been absolutely clear that, the, that what will be included in the guidance is the minimum criteria of free school meal entitlement. Mm -hmm. Any decisions to apply further exemptions will be for, for local councils to apply. So we're simply representing the views of our members. We are not, uh, it's not our job to tell our members what to do. We're representing the views of our members. And a number of councils were very strong in this particular matter. And, and can I ask then, did the board take a view with regard to there being a cap on the level that councils charge? No. 
No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Mackay. Yeah, really very similar to, to um, my colleague's question there about, I heard what you're saying about local autonomy, etc. I was going to ask if um, COSLA ever gave guidelines or guidance to councils about anything, and you've kind of answered that because you did about school, school meals. So is that the case then? You can be selective? Yeah, well, no, not being selective, uh, we were approached by the government around this, that particular area, and the government obviously had received strong lobbying from particular interest groups, uh, perfectly legitimate, uh, and the government said that they would be prepared to, to provide additional funding. Uh, we had a discussion around the government. We get, came to a potential agreement. We took that through the appropriate democratic decision-making processes in COSLA, which in that occasion was the 32 leaders of the councils who were there to represent the views of the 32 councils. And they, they signed up to that particular package. And every council then implemented uh, from the start of the, the new uh, academic term a minimum uh, school clothing grant of £100. Some have a school clothing grant more than £100. I understand that, but that, that was on the, the back of you getting more money to, to take that decision. Mm -hmm. Do you ever issue guidelines where money is not on the table? Yeah, well, we're, we're intending to issue guidance around this particular area, um, and we're working on that guidance at the moment and, and discussing it with the government and, uh, and, and the other uh, stakeholders. And so, so, sorry, about music tuition? Yes, yes. Are you, do you want to expand on that, what that might be? Well, Eddie can come in in particular yeah. detail around that, but as I said earlier on, it's, it's about um, setting a minimum with regard to charging around free school meal and technology, not charging for SQA, but also providing information on good practice and, 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 and looking at um, drawing from other councils' um, experiences. And, and I suppose if, if some councils want to change their policy in the back of that guidance, they're perfectly entitled to do it. But it's not it's not imposing a policy, it's simply providing them with guidance there. Did you want to go in a bit yeah, more no, detail? No, I'm happy to expand. And, and just as Councillor McCabe said, um, you know, we're looking at um, writing into that that there'll be no charges for SQA, which goes back to the recommendations from 2013. Um, we're looking at free school meals being the, the minimum. And it's important, I think, to recognise within that that a lot of councils go further than that. Um, and go further than just you know free school meals being the minimum, but we're you know we, we want to see that that as a minimum kind of exemption, and at the same time um, we also want to look at how one of the things we've heard from campaigners is about communication and how the decisions around charging is communicated. That can be quite frustrating for for for, for families and for parents. So we want to kind of get see if we can get some. Um, some uh, transparency around that, around rationale for charging and explaining why this is having to be done as well. Um, and also p perhaps looking at unintended consequences because we know that there are sometimes, you know, in these difficult decisions, there are consequences that, that you don't really think about and, and, and doing that through highlighting good practice. Um, because we know that across the country there is really good practice. I think what you heard from councillors as well about, you know, whether there are bursaries in place, whether there are things that can really ease the, the pressure both on the council in terms of providing it, but particularly on, on families as well. So we're working on that at the moment. Um, uh, we're going to be doing that and co uh, co-working closely with the Scottish Government on it and with the uh, music Education Partnership Group as well, um, uh, and they've got a lot of examples that they can bring and a lot of expertise they can bring. So we're very open to kind of doing that. So we're just trying to find a way here um, to, uh, um, I, I suppose, imp improve the situation as much as we can. But I think it's fair to say that guidance will only be implemented and issued if approved by our board, made up of the conveners of the 32 councils. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mandel. Thank you, uh, Convener Councillor McKibbe, you mentioned uh, just there in answer to a colleague that uh, previous sort of initiatives and policy changes have come about when you've been approached uh, by the Scottish Government. Have you been approached by the Scottish Government at all um, in relation to, to instrumental music tuition? Not formally, no. Okay. Just, just before we move on, uh, Councillor McKibbe, you, um, you mentioned about the democratic decision making and, and, and setting policies, but um, all the evidence that we've heard has been really positive around the Youth Music Initiative, which is obviously a policy um, set, set by the Scottish Government and, and delivered in partnership with COSLA. So, given that it is local democracy, that there, there are um, examples of, of working practice that can achieve the policy goals and, and have worked very well. 
in Scotland. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think across the board, I think that music is flourishing in, in, in our schools and our local authorities. I mean, I've been a, around for a few years, shall we say, a, as a councillor, and I've seen in, in the schools and in, in, in my authority how music has improved significantly over the, the last decade or so. I mean, in the past, there were schools, yes, that had particular traditions in music, and maybe that was a reflection of the, the, the makeup of the, the, the pupils and the, the backgrounds of the pupils. Um, but I now see across the board a very high standard of, of music within all our local secondary schools, including the, the school that I attended, my children attend, where perhaps 10 years ago, music wasn't particularly strong, but now it is very strong. So I think, yeah, there, there has been significant progress and there's been a absolute there's been an increase in uptake in music tuition on the whole over the last decade or so there has been more recently a, a dip we'll accept that and that's potentially in the back of, of charging issues but I, I think music on the whole is flourishing in, in our schools thank you uh, Smith. Uh, thank you convener um Councillor McCabe, could I just ask you about the article that was in the Herald uh, two days ago, Andy Denham's uh, Herald article. And I quote the first paragraph where it says that Midlothian Council is the first local authority in Scotland to pass on the cost of tuition for music qualifications such as higher and advanced higher, rather than funding it from its central budget. Uh, were you aware of this? I, I didn't read that particular article, I have to say. I often find that I can't get beyond the paywall in, in terms of the her art articles. But I'm aware of that particular issue, and I've seen correspondence around that issue, uh, including from the, the leader of Midlothian Council. And as I, as I understand it, uh, basically, again, as part of a, a difficult budget decision, the, the, the council, and Eddie will keep me right here, the, the, the council made a decision to um, take the funding of, of music tuition out of a central budget and ask schools to, to fund it from their devolved budgets. That's my understanding. Uh, thank you. W would you recognise that uh, should that go ahead, that there is um, charging for SQA, that that is very much at odds with um, the views that have been expressed that that shouldn't happen? Well, personally, I don't see that as charging for SQA. The, the, the head teacher of the school obviously has a, a devolved budget and the head teacher of the school can choose to use that devolved budget to, to, to obviously not to charge. Now, it does mean all things being equal, there's less money to spend on other things, but that's exactly the, the, the situation facing the council. So if the council had decided to centrally maintain that budget, then the council would have had to cut something else. So that's, that, that's the, the harsh realities of, of, of life as we face it. And if we go on further uh, in terms of the discussions we're obviously having with the government around uh, further uh, devolution of, of, of budgetary responsibilities to school and empowering head teachers, uh, head teachers will be taking more decisions like that because that's, that's what seems to be the consensus, uh, cross-party consensus that head teachers should have, have more power uh, and, and, and accountability for, for budgets and decision making. And, and I think West, uh, sorry, Midlothian have taken that particular approach. Uh, who am I to criticise that approach? Uh, th thank you for um, your view on that. I, I think there is a very serious issue here, uh, not just for music uh, tuition generally, but if th there are to be charges for pupils sitting SQA qualifications in music, when that doesn't uh, occur for other uh, SQA qualifications. Would, would COSLA, as the umbrella body for the councils, be happy about that, where it's obviously discriminating very much against music in relation to other subjects? Well, as I said, I mean, at the last meeting of our board, we got agreement from the board, and I'm sure Midlothian were actually represented at, at, at the board meeting, that there would be no charging for, it, for, for SQA exams. And as I says, as I understand it, there won't be charging in schools in Midlothian. The school will find the funding for that from their devolved budget, which comes to them from the council. Um, I would like to think you might be uh, right on that, but it, th th this article is making very clear that the campaigners um, who fear that other councils, and I quote again, other councils will adopt this tactic and could see the decline in the number of uh, people sitting music exams. It will restrict choice with pupils having to select instruments commonly taught at the school, such as percussion and guitar, uh, rather than those requiring expert output, uh, sorry, expert input from outside, um, where um, 
instruments and strings, wood, woodwind and brass. Can I ask again, would, would COSLA be comfortable about that situation? Co COSLA's view, as determined by the most recent meeting of our Children and Young People Board, is that council should not charge for SQA exams for, for music. So that's COSLA's agreed position of the 32 councils. And I don't accept that interpretation that that is charging for exams. And the fact of the matter, I've, I've saw a letter from the, the leader of Midlothian Council, I think that might have been circulated to, to, the, to the committee. And, and the, I think the, in that letter from, from memory, um, he says there won't be charges for SQA exams. My final question, I think the problem that we have as a committee, having heard a lot of the evidence, is that the young people particularly who have been involved in, uh, in, in music tuition and very successfully, if I may say so, um, there are serious concerns that many youngsters are being excluded, particularly if these charges um, are obviously very difficult to pay for just now. And, and we know without any doubt that youngsters are, are not taking up music uh, tuition as a result of this. This kind of concern just adds to that. Uh, and even if it wasn't passed on to the parents, well, I think we know that that is, is probably going to happen. Even if it didn't, the schools do not have the same ability to make the choices that are required to allow that equity across the board. Do you accept that? I don't accept that those charges will be passed on to parents. So, because I've got, I've signed a letter from the leader of Midlothian Council saying that's not going to happen. So, I don't accept the, the premise of, of your question. But the, but the fundamental reality is whether it's schools or councils or any other public body, we're all making difficult decisions at this point in time, and we're all making difficult decisions which affect young people as well. Uh, I mean, last year when, when my council was going through our budget process and we had a huge list of savings proposals, many of those potentially affected young people, like the reduction in youth services, like introducing charging for free swimming, where, for swimming where we've currently got swimming free. So there's a whole range of areas if you, if you want to take music in isolation or education in isolation, which happens a lot of the time, then that's fine. You can have a particular debate around priorities. Councils have to deliver a whole range of services to a whole range of people, and we make, have to make difficult decisions constantly around these and prioritisation. Politics is the language of priorities. Socialism is the language of priorities. That's the fundamental reality at the end of the day. You have to, you have to make hard decisions in life, and we're faced with those hard decisions in life, and we want to try and give our young people the best opportunities in life. Absolutely. We, I, I, I would want a whole range of services that are currently charged for to be free, but I have to live in the real world. I have to live within the funding that this parliament allocates to my council. Somewhere in the region of... 85% of the funding of my council comes directly from a block grant from this government, for, for the government and via this parliament. And we then raise somewhere in the region of 10 to 12% from council tax. This parliament dictates how much we can increase council tax by. And then we're left with fees and charges. And the simple reality is, why have fees and charges across the board in councils went up over the last decade? Because of a freeze and now a cap in the council tax and because of real terms reduction in block grants. So we're increasing charges in burial, burial grounds, we're in, increasing charges in parking, a whole range of service we've in, increased or introduced new charges in. And that's the simple fact of life that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Ms. Goldruth. Just a brief supplementary on uh, Liz Smith's line of questioning with regard to selection tests. Um, the committee has heard evidence that selection tests are quite routinely used across the country by local authorities to identify people's, um, I don't like to use the expression, but with aptitude, um, which can in itself cause a level of inequity. Um, does COSLA have a view with regard to the use of selection tests? Okay. Uh, Eddie, bring an idea on that. Um, I, 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 at this moment, no. Um, uh, I would have to come back to you on that one. Okay, um, and just then, uh, following on from that, um, there also seems to be a variation in terms of when pupils are first exposed to music tuition and what instruments they are um, offered. Does Gosla have a view with regard to that? Uh, not at the moment, but I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. Thank you. Mr MacDonald? Just to continue what Liz Smith was, was asking about earlier on in relation to Midlothian Council, um, the letter that we received said that um, schools, secondary schools could be charged up to £38,000 per year uh, for music tuition recharge. 
What, what impact would that have on the other activities that the school would previously have provided if they have to meet £38,000 worth of costs? Well, I think £38,000 is across the authority. That's the authority. No, it says uh, will result in sums between 7000 and 38000 being recovered from individual secondary school okay. budgets this year. So, so I, I'm not familiar with how many schools there are in, in Mid Lothian. I don't know the size of each of the secondary schools and I don't know so the size of the budget. So I, 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 would, I suspect £38,000 in the typical budget of, of a secondary school. Yeah, it would be a reasonably, a, a reasonably significant a, a amount mm. of money, yes, absolutely. Um, but uh, what decisions uh, would be made by the head teacher as a consequence, I, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be able to second guess that. But uh, as I said earlier, the reality is that will mean that the school will have less money to spend on other things, mm -hmm. just if, as if the council uh, bore that cost, the council would have less money to spend on other things. And if other councils were to start r rolling this out, would COSLA discuss this at their board level and issue guidance about whether they thought it was a, an effective way to recover funds? We have no indication that any, any council is planning to, to, to do that, so it's not something that, that, that we have considered or, or have a view on. I'm sure if, I'm sure if it came up at our board, the, the board would have a view, but I'd need to see what the view of the board is. And if there... If, if, say, additional funding was found for music tuition and there is no ring fencing, how do you guarantee that a council would actually use that money for music tuition? Well, I don't, I don't think you can guarantee that. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and COSLA's obviously position on behalf of local government would be that we don't like ring fencing. We think we are democratically elected in the same way that you're democratically elected and that we basically should have discretion as to how we spend our, uh, uh, the, the, the public's money. And uh, if the public are not happy with decisions that we make on that, then they can exercise their democratic right to, to express that dis dissatisfaction at the, the following election. OK, thanks so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm very conscious of time, so I know, I know there's some members wanting in, and I will try and bring you in at the end, but I'm going to move to Joanne Lamont. Yeah, um, it's just a very brief question, really. Um, I think one of the arguments that's been, I mean, I hear exactly what you say about the financial context, having to make tough choices. There's no easy choice. You're choosing between lots of bad options. Um, but I, I think the argument put by folk who are advocates for music is that it is being treated differently from other subjects, that, that it's not a level playing field. You know, and, and I would be concerned, for example, there'll be some secondary schools in Glasgow which no longer offer geography, history and modern studies, they may offer a, a one or two of them. I wonder what your view is on the argument that's been made that music, um, music tuition, which is the core part of getting an SQA qualification, is looked at differently from the cost round somebody studying another subject. And as COSLA looked at this question of ma making sure that all subjects are treated with the same kind of value and understanding what is core, to some of these subjects. And the second question, just in order to get over with and not take up too much time, the other argument is put forward by music tuition specialists is there were a, a, a tipping point that if, if, if there's a reduction in uptake, we lose the qualified teachers. People will not train in that, they'll not do that job any longer. So when the financial circumstances improve, we won't be able to recover. And I wonder if you've got a view on that. I'm going to bring Eddie in on those particular points, but in, in terms of music being treated differently, or music tuition being treated differently, it's, it's a discretionary service, so it is different. That's that's the reality of it. So but if you're an SQ, if, well, you know, if you're doing um, an SQ qualification, you're hired in advanced hired, you need to be able to um, perform on two instruments. It's not an, you can't do it otherwise. No, we, ex we accept that, but... So it's not, in that sense, it's not discretionary. No, and I wonder whether because in people's heads, the tuition bit is seen as different rather than fundamental, it, it then gets treated differently. I'm not disagreeing with you at all around the financial context and the tough choices. I just wonder what reassurance you can give around music not being seen as somehow diff treated differently from a science subject or um, a language or whatever. Well, I, I would hope that all councils and, and all schools va value music, absolutely, and will do their best to, to make it as accessible as possible to, to young people and support young people to achieve the qualifications that they're, they're capable of achieving. But uh, with regard to music tuition, it is, 
it is um, discretionary, unless it's obviously part of uh, the process of leading to. But my to, point to is, if it's fundamental to an SQA qualification, if something else is fundamental to an SQA qualification in science or whatever, there wouldn't be the same view. I mean, I'm simply asking the question. There wouldn't be the same view that somehow we can pass that on to school or to the individual um, in, in the same way. I mean, just, what is the argument? Well, 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 our view would be appropriate music tuition as provided to those who are studying for exams. There, there may well be, and I've, I've, I've obviously read the, the, the briefing papers, and there may well be views that that, that tuition should apply from an earlier stage. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a debate to be had around that. And, as I said earlier, I'm no any expert in music. Um, I would imagine the earlier you start learning instruments, the better you are by the time you come to. So absolutely, there, there's, there's a debate around that. In an ideal world, I'd like my council to be able to provide free music tuition from a very early age, in, in primary and uh, and through to secondary. But we don't we don't live in in, in, in that we ideal. We wouldn't ask somebody who's sitting high a friend John to start studying it in fifth year. No, that's, that's, I mean, I absolutely get the context, the financial context. I simply put to you that well, the reason I don't, why I don't people think you, externally are exercised by this is that perceived there's, there's a general good in music tuition. I don't think there's music, a fundamental need in music tuition if you're going to do it in SQA, and I wonder why. Yeah, but I don't think music tuition starts in fifth year. Well, the point is, if it's discretionary, if, if so, if I need to do. I have to be taught an instrument in order to sit higher. But I'm being expected to pay for that because tuition is regarded as discretionary or the school's expected to pay for it. And my, um, my uh, question to you is, is that fair or is music seen as, as being seen as different and that somehow the tuition is a bonus rather than a necessary part? It clearly is seen as different because it's a discretionary service, but I'll bring Eddie in in terms of detail. Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've nothing, not that much to add on this, and I, and, and I, take, I, take, I take the point, you know, that there's obviously there's, that there's an issue there and a debate to be had around that, but, um, and maybe that's something that we, you know, we can look at in guidance as well around unintended, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, but, but at the moment, that's, you know, that, that's, as much, that's as much as we can do, but I, I don't really have much to add to what Councillor McCabe... Can, can not, second question. It was really this question about... Um, I've forgotten one second question now, but I'm interested in whether... Is there a kind of a causal approach to looking at the offer of subjects across the board? Because, you know, if you, if a, if you no longer have a geography teacher, you no longer offer geography, that school no longer has that opportunity. You could argue this... I suppose it's the broader context about no, it, people it, making tough budget choices, which then mean that the breadth of opportunities within school are more limited. And that's not necessarily the fault of the local authority, but it is an, another consequence, perhaps, of the funding challenges. I mean, I, I don't think it's something that we, in particular, have, have, have looked at. But, I mean, I think the consequences are, or the reasons for that are, are, are probably not just financial. It's a bit shortage of teachers as well. Uh, and funding is a, is a big part of it as well, but it's a, a, sh a shortage of teachers. And, and we, the question earlier was around workforce planning. We've got huge issues in terms of workforce planning across the whole education estate. And, and let's be clear, I mean, you're you you touching a, a, and about the next generation of sort of music instructors and whatever. The, 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 pressure, the pressure is not just on for charging. The pressure in councils is to actually reduce the number of music instructors as well. That's the simple reality. It's not just about charging. There are councils who have probably reduced music instructors or who have savings options to reduce the, the number of music instructors. And it might be instructors in particular instruments which are, are, are not particularly popular, uh, very, very limited numbers. And so it's not just around charging. Councils are actually looking at, at savings that may well reduce the number of music instructors as well. Which was the fundamental point that they were making, which is if, if you cut too deep or you have to make choices now, it's not survivable through to a point where perhaps a better financial context. Yeah, and, and that's just the harsh reality of decisions, as I said, we're making on a day-to-day -day basis. And we can sit here in this room and discuss music tuition. But you can get into another committee, it's got another area and discuss something else. That's the hard decisions that have been made as a consequence of the decisions made by the elected members of this parliament. So I would urge you, uh, if you're concerned about 
uh, reductions and cuts in essential services that are provided by local government. You've got an opportunity in the coming weeks and months to address that by giving local government a fair settlement. Okay, I'm going to bring in Mr Scott. Um, and on that fair settlement, uh, Mr McCabe, you and Councillor have made a submission to the government for next week's budget. Does it include music? It, it doesn't include music specifically. I mean, we're looking for we're looking for a, a fair settlement overall. There's no sp specific ask on, on, on music, um, but obviously, if we were to get the <clears throat> the settlement that we're seeking, that would make it far easier for councils to protect services like music. Uh, I assume uh, when councillors make that submission, they build up through the different portfolio areas. You make a very fair point about the spread of council services. You build up across the portfolios that you're responsible for a number which comes in at, yeah. at the top line but but music in terms of the education aspects which i guess is your responsibility isn't specifically included in that ask no no but it's, it's part of the overall current cost of the ed the living education and we would obviously look at what it would cost to deliver the same service next year and and, and inflate that yeah. lauren's our expert in financial yeah. i'm sorry my, my voice might go and i apologize about this um, in terms of of where music sits, that sits very much as part of local authorities' core budgets. Where, over the last few years, or since 2011 12, because of initiative funding, um, we've seen core budgets reduced from 98% of the funding that local government received in terms of the block grant to 88%. And because of um, ring fencing on various parts of the budget, including things like teacher numbers. Um, and, and you know the, the cost to deliver health and social care, um, etc. The savings that local government have to make from core budgets can only be taken from 42% of the budget that comes to a local authority. So actually, when we talk about core budgets, we're talking about services like music tuition, and the impact of reductions on those core budgets are significant, and they become more significant every year. And they also become more significant the more there are ring-fenced pots of money um, and initiative funding. And that's, that's where the, the sticking plaster um, that Councillor McCabe talked about earlier actually makes things quite difficult for local government because it deals with issues in, in quite a siloed and singular way. And that's not the way that, that local government have to set their budgets. Um, so the, the, the core funding is really the place that, that we're talking about when we talk about instrumental music tuition and protection of the core is something that, that is vital. Okay, that's very fair. Um, just on the policy, uh, from your earlier answers to, to colleagues around the table, you're not arguing for um, a dedicated fund for, for to do four million pounds to do away with music tuition, are you? That's not part no. of your pitch? No. no. And in policy terms, you're not arguing for ring fencing, therefore by definition? That's correct. So therefore, when we ask the government, uh, do they have a role on what they're going to do about it, your, your, your request of them is not to increase or indeed to include a ring-fenced amount for music tuition. What you're arguing for is core funding to be augmented. Um, but, but the government, never mind Parliament, would have no say, because it's a democratic responsibility of your, of your uh, councils, uh, to make decisions over what would happen to music tuition in the future. That's fair to say, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Mr McDonald's. You no, I've covered you're, you're fine. Uh, um, bring in Ms Mackay. Um, yeah, can I just ask you if um, you know of any local authorities that are piloted different mechanisms for, for you know, a different framework for introducing music? Uh, is that good practice you were talking about earlier? So is that something that you're going to issue guidance on to the other local authorities? Okay, bring Eddie in on that but yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I can't go through specific examples, but we certainly know um, both from the Music uh, Education Partnership Group that, that they work with and are aware of a lot, a lot of local authorities who do things a wee bit differently. We heard last week, I think, from, um, eh, no, two weeks ago, was it, from the from the councils, um, where they, there was a number of initiatives. Um, I think Pierre and Ross introduced bursaries. So there was different ways to do that. So we're looking at what, what can we highlight as good practice that could be adopted by authorities to take that kind of pressure off? So that would be that would be a central part of the guidance, and we'll work with, with, with MEPEG on, on on how we develop that. Mm -hmm. Just going back to uh, Joanne Lamont's um, question about discre discretionary subjects, it strikes me that music is a creative subject. And art is a creative subject in school, and yet art doesn't seem to come into the equation when it comes to um, 
it being sort of singled out. Would you have any view on that at all? I don't think I, but I would have. It's not something I've thought about. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the certainly back in uh, um, we, the, back in 2012, I think the, this debate was was going on, and I think it was generally recognised that there was there was a cost to to music. You know, there was a cost to to, to music tuition and, and 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 learning a musical instrument that there, there might not be attached to other subjects. But I mean, that's the only. Uh, that's, you know the, the the only thing I can think of because there is you know the, 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 in terms of the, the the instrument and travel and if it's orchestras and, and local authorities you know uh, whilst charging is going on we have to recognise that there's a whole load of good work goes on a whole load of um, orchestras and, um, and and music initiatives right across Scotland that, that continue. So it's not that music seen as a kind of luxury subject then it's it's just that it's the easiest one to to cut when it comes to costs. I wouldn't say it's a, a, a luxury subject. I think probably just the resource in terms of music, tuition, instruments, etc., is more costly than any other subject. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Gray, did you want to come back in? I cut you short earlier on. You fine? Uh, Dr. Allen, you wanted to? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, in a sense, I'm picking up the same point as uh, Miss Lamont picked up on, but I just want to say that again, relevant. I think some one of the things that the students were telling us was that the overwhelming disparity in terms now of, uh, of people coming into uh, studies after school in music from, from a private school background. And again, I just wondered, since uh, you undertook there when Ms. Lamont asked her question to look at some of these questions, you know, wh whether you would consider you know, issues of equality and inequality around that, because as Ms. Lamont pointed out, and I, I do want to point this out again, that I can't think of other subjects where you would be told in fifth year, well, you haven't been able to afford to get to the necessary stage where you can actually do advanced hire. We'll offer you the necessary tuition now, but it's too late. Music, like every other subject, is, is lifelong learning. Uh, you can you can pursue music or qualifications for, for your life. But, but you can't if you can't afford to. Well, well, there's lots of things that you can't do in this world, in this life, because you can't afford to. That's the simple reality. Lots chemistry. of things. That, sorry? Chemistry. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about particular subjects. I'm talking about things in life that you, you, can, you can do, uh, 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 that some people can do because their parents can afford it, and other things you can't do because your parents can't afford it. That, that's, that's life, unfortunately. That's part of the reflection of the unequal society that we, we live in. And, but you wouldn't yeah, apply that argument to chemistry. I'm, I'm not applying it to chemistry, but I mean the, the reality. The reality in terms of music tuition, obviously, is it is a discretionary service. It's a costly service, and in relation to in relation to particular instruments you need, etc., there's a, a, a cost to that. Uh, it's it, legislatively, it's a discretionary service. That's that's the difference. We are not comparing like with like. The Parliament may choose to change that. <coughs> you may. That's that's entirely a decision for yourselves. But we are dealing with the situation as it stands now and the very difficult choices that councils have to make. And I, I reiterate the point. I'm absolutely sure that no council would wish to charge for services if they thought there was an alternative, a better alternative. And I'm absolutely no council sure no council would charge if we were properly funded. Yeah. Uh, can I, I, I just ask a final question, Councillor McCabe? We, um, I've spoken to a number of young people in different contexts over the, the course of this investigation, and um, for many of them who weren't going on to study music, um, when they talked about their experience of the instrumental music service and the orchestras, for them it wasn't about you know achieving a, a level of excellence in music. It was about the friendship groups. It was about the additional skills they had working with a group, not letting people down. And, and a huge issue for all of us at the moment is, is young people's mental health, and all of them expressed um, a view about it being a de-stressor and things. And in speaking to some of the councils, I, I would say that in some councils, that, that's very well understood, but maybe in other councils, it, it's not. And the decision-making process that's been made on the budgets um, uh, aren't been made on the same basis, but it's considered a core subject and absolutely vital in some areas and not in others. Has COSLA taken any view on, on the approach towards music from that point of view, um, particularly as we've, you've mentioned 
quite frequently unintentional um, consequences of actually losing this service across the councils. I mean, I don't think we've got a particular view at this point in time. I, I think there's many views in local government around music and the value of music, and I, I absolutely, I, I, I value music, and I think all young people should be able to pursue the interests that they are interested in, whether that be sport or music or, or, or some other for, form of arts, absolutely. And we want to create as many opportunities as, as we can for, for young people. And we will reflect on the outcome of this inquiry. I mean, we, we, we're we not conducting an inquiry ourselves around these particular issues, because that's not the remit we've got from our board. Where we, but we will listen, we'll reflect, and we'll take the outcome of this inquiry back to our board for consideration. And if there are lessons that can be learnt from this inquiry, absolutely, uh, councils will, will give them serious consideration. Okay. Um, I think that draws our questions to a conclusion this morning. Can I, I thank you once again, Councillor McCabe and the officials from COSA. We do really appreciate you coming and engaging with the committee this morning. I am going to suspend briefly while we change over witnesses.
morning and um, welcome to our second panel this morning. And uh, I would like to welcome John Swinney, MSP, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, and Malcolm Pentland, Head of Curriculum Unit at the Scottish Government. And I understand, Cabinet Secretary, you'd like an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, if I can make a brief opening statement. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of all of the expressive arts for Scotland's culture and economy. We know too the many significant benefits that participation in music and the arts can have on the lives of our children and young people and their families. Participation in music and the arts provides children and young people with opportunities to be creative and imaginative and to experience inspiration and enjoyment, contributing greatly to their mental, emotional, social and physical well-being. Opportunities for children and young people to learn to play a musical instrument through tuition in our schools is an important element of participation in the arts. Scotland has a music education system with an instrumental music service operating in every local authority that has been highly regarded across the United Kingdom and internationally for its quality and inclusivity. Indeed, this was highlighted in the Instrumental Music Group's 2013 report. I understand and share the concerns of young people, their parents and families and those working in the sector over any reduction in the quality or reach of those services in any part of Scotland. As the committee is aware, the Scottish education system is set up in such a way that decision-making is devolved to the most appropriate level, enabling local education authorities to make choices that meet their local circumstances and needs. Local authorities decide how to provide instrumental music tuition depending on local circumstances, priorities and traditions. Whilst maintaining respect for the, author for the autonomy of our local authorities, the Scottish Government is committed to working collaboratively with partners. A working group led by the Chair of the Music Education Partnership Group and bringing together representation from the Government and the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities is actively considering ways to ensure that instrumental music tuition remains accessible. That work is ongoing and progress has been made towards ensuring minimum eligibility criteria for full concessions for tuition in certain circumstances and on the development of clear guidance for local authorities. I welcome the committee's interest in this issue and the opportunity to answer questions from members and I look forward to giving full consideration to the conclusions of the committee's inquiry as well as to the, the outcomes of the working group and recommendations of the What's Going On Now report to be published early in the new year. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to move to Mr Gray. Uh, morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I uh, wanted to ask about the evidence the committee's heard about the, the breadth of variation uh, in the schemes for instrumental tuition. So um, in your opening remarks, you made the perfectly correct point that these are local decisions which are taken by local authorities. Nonetheless, the uh, 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 current position varies from those authorities where instrumental tuition is free for everyone to others where families are asked to contribute quite a few hundreds of pounds uh, for each child. Do you, are you content with that, that variation or are you concerned about it? Uh, I, I think that, there's, as Mr Gray correctly says, there's a, there's a variation. And there are some authorities that are not charging at all and some that are charging what I would consider to be significant amounts of money for um, instrumental music tuition in a year. Uh, so yes, I am concerned about that range because um, I think uh, there is quite clearly a risk that the cost um, is an inhibitor to the participation of young people within instrumental music tuition and given the context of my remarks to the committee this morning already, um, the committee would be right to conclude that I view participation in instrumental music tuition as advantageous to young people within Scotland. Um, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I think the committee, I've certainly heard evidence that there is a risk that some are, um, what's the right word, discouraged from participating because of charging. Uh, and actually, uh, some evidence, for example, from the Improvement Service, which shows that even those uh, young people, because they're eligible for free school <coughs> meals, who wouldn't have to pay, actually participate less in instrumental tu music tuition than the rest of the school population. I, I know that equity in our education system is something that uh, you, Mr Swinney, 
uh, are concerned about and often talk about. Does, does that worry you then? It, yes, because um, clearly there are, um, you, you know, there are factors with which we are all familiar around um, eligibility for free school meals, which obviously weighed very heavily in the government's consideration uh, when we moved to make um, school meals free for primary one to three pupils, because we felt uh, there was a danger that young people who were eligible for free school meals were not taking up free school meals and getting the, the nutritional value of that within the day, um, were essentially discouraged because of the danger of stigma um, uh, from taking up those free school meals. The same issues can apply to instrumental music tuition. Obviously, uh, there are ways in which um, schools in their knowledge of pupils and their knowledge of circumstances uh, can handle these matters in a fashion that uh, can be carefully handled to make sure that that is not in fact an impediment to young people participating. But I do accept that there is a risk of that uh, as a consequence. Okay, so that, that's an example you, you've given our Cabinet Secretary of addressing a problem by moving to universality uh, in terms of school meals P1 to 3. Um, so all the evidence that we've heard uh, from local authorities in the inquiry has been that decisions about increasing or imposing charging for instrumental mu music tuition have been taken for reasons of financial constraint. Nobody has said to us we've introduced charging because we thought educationally that was a good idea. They've all said it's about uh, balancing the budget. So an obvious way out of this would be for the Scottish Government centrally to provide funding to allow instrumental music tuition to be provided free across the board. This morning that was put to COSLA, uh, to Councillor McCabe, who made it clear, I think, that that would not be their preferred option because they don't like ring fencing, but also made clear that pragmatically they would be open to that kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. So have you ever considered that as a possibility or discussed that with COSLA? Yeah, I haven't considered that yet, no, um, because I think what the data shows us is that some local authorities, despite all of the issues that are raised in general about local authority finance, attach the priority to this that they make uh, eligible or access to instrumental music tuition free. And that's the case in a number of local authorities, including some of our very significant authorities, uh, Dundee, Edinburgh, the Western Isles, Glasgow, Orkney, Renfrewshire and Western Bartonshire. So some local authorities uh, within the context of the challenges that surround the public finances um, have taken a policy decision that eligibility should be free. Other local authorities have taken decisions to charge and to charge at more modest levels. Um, and some authorities have uh, applied higher charges. But I think fundamentally um, the issue which emerges to me out of the evidence that is available to us is that some local authorities recognise the value of instrumental music tuition and want to put in place uh, no barriers to the access to instrumental music tuition as a consequence of the decisions that they themselves have made within their local authority finances. But the same arguments would apply, for example, to levels of school clothing grant, where the government did take a view that they would provide additional funding in order to have a more equitable service. Why? Why is this different? Well, but, well in, in some circumstances, um, in some circumstances here, local authorities are opting to provide an entirely free service. And well, I, some I think, of them had high school clothing grants well. As well. But, but in, in a circumstance of tackling, uh, I, I think there's a difference between school clothing grants and instrumental music tuition, uh, where in, uh, clothing grants are about making sure that young people are properly supported to maintain their accessibility to education. That is, to me, a pretty fundamental point about the ability of young people to participate in education. Um, instrumental music tuition is not available to every pupil. Um, and uh, what we have to be careful about, and this is where individual local authorities are making judgments about this point, that we retain that accessibility for young people who have an interest and 
and enthusiasm to pursue that instrumental music tradition because in other aspects of our policy agenda, for example, through the Youth Music Initiative, we, en we enable all pupils to have some experience of instrumental music tuition. So in a, a different aspect of our policy agenda through the Youth Music Initiative, we are making it possible for every pupil to have that experience. This is about some, which is what I would equate to the school clothing grant. This is um, a provision which is about ensuring that young people who have an interest and an aptitude to pursue this are able to pursue it without impediment. Okay, Mr. Greer. Um, Deputy First Minister, in 1980, the UK government began direct funding of places at the private St Mary's Music School in Edinburgh. That's been continued um, since devotion by the Scottish Executive and then by uh, the Scottish Government. It amounts to over £1 million a year of uh, public money going to a private music school for funded places. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of uh, the value for money of that funding? Obviously, we consider on uh, an annual basis uh, in dialogue with St Mary's Music School the, um, uh, the, con the considerations that are relevant in relation to that public expenditure. We assess the contribution that is made to um, uh, the, the development of music education in Scotland as a consequence of that, and we judge accordingly uh, the funding that's made available to the music school uh, on the basis of that assessment? It doesn't publicly appear as if assessment has been made, but I accept that a substantial portion of, of uh, budget setting each year doesn't look like that. Um, but at the beginning of, of this process, this committee was uh, told by a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament who herself had been affected by the increase in charges in West Lothian's um, public schools for a music tuition. She described the situation as creating Victorian levels of inequality. Can you understand why when uh, music tuition in our state schools is being squeezed as a result of wider budget constraints, the significant funding of a private music school can give the appearance of that Victorian level of inequality only being compounded? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really see a connection between the two issues, uh, to be honest. Um, the St Mary's Music School is um, uh, is, is, is a particular institution of musical excellence uh, which has been received long-standing funding from the public purse. Uh, the government also supports specialist musical institutions, uh, uh, I, I should say uh, specialist artistic institutions within our state schools. Um, uh, Broughton High School, for example, is one such school that is, um, uh, that, that is supported directly. Um, we support the um, through the local government settlement uh, through Highland Council, uh, the music school in Plotton. Uh, we also support um, the uh, dance school, which is uh, part of a uh, Drum Chapel High School. Um, so there are a number of ways in which, through the state system, we support specialist artistic provision within the state system. Um, and then, also, obviously, also. Uh, there is provision of instrumental music tuition through uh, the state school sector in general, but obviously the issues of charging, which Mr Greer raises with me, um, may present themselves as a financial impediment to some people's participation in that education. Why, when, I mean, you've mentioned that there are centres of excellence within our, our, our state school system for centres of excellence for, for music. Um, why does the government believe that it is a greater value for money to provide, uh, it's roughly 1.2, 1.3 million pounds a year to St Mary's rather than to provide them either to those centres of excellence within our state system or elsewhere within the state system? Because we are acknowledging the long-standing uh, value to uh, musical education in Scotland that's been provided by St Mary's Music School. And uh, I think that's been, uh, uh, you know, there's acknowledged expertise in the school. Um, the government has judged that it would not be appropriate to, uh, to discontinue that support. Uh, we recognise the value this provides and the specialist opportunities for young people to thrive as a consequence of their participation there. The block grant for local government that in turn results in music tuition being provided within state schools to a greater or lesser extent has obviously been cut since 2010 um, and we will have that debate all over again uh, this year in the coming weeks. But in that same period of time, the grant given to this private school has not reduced at all. Um, 
why is that the case when the uh, funding being provided to public schools, who will eventually provide the same service, has been reduced? Well, there obviously, there's a variety of different issues in relation to um, local authority expenditure. Um, clearly, the government has had to wrestle since 2010 with significant reductions in our budget. Um, we have um, dealt with local government fairly within that context, and indeed, in the last three years, um, local authority um, education expenditure has been increasing and in the current financial year is increasing in real terms, increased in real terms in the last year. So there is, uh, I think it's important to bear in mind all of the different elements of the pattern of local authority financing that have taken their course. And of course, within that um, perspective on local authority financing, individual local authorities, and I've recounted them to Mr Gray already, um, have decided that they will not apply any charging for instrumental music tuition. Now, when it comes to the, um, the issues in connection with St Mary's Music School, uh, we, we do get to questions and levels of viability of institutions if we significantly reduce uh, resources that are available to them. And uh, that would be an issue the government would have to consider very carefully in how we, um, uh, has been a consequence of the actions that, uh, that could be taken from a reduction in financing. And just one final question, Convener. The last SSI in relation to the funding for St Mary's was in 2015. When does the government intend to bring forward the next SSI in relation to these regulations? Um, I would have to check the, the, the details of what is required. Um, I suspect uh, an SSI would only be required if we were changing the financing arrangements, which would be to increase them. And um, I obviously don't want to uh, prejudge the contents of the Finance Secretary's budget next uh, next week. Um, so I perhaps not better not give a specific answer to the question that Mr Greer uh, raises uh, any further for me. Understand. Or Thank I really you. will be in some difficulty. Thank you. Can I bring in Dr Allen? Thanks. Um, one of the, the questions uh, I was asking and others were asking um, the COSLA representatives who were here earlier on today um, was uh, essentially whether they, they took a view beyond saying that these things are a matter for local authorities, whether they had any collective position uh, or took any collective responsibility. And the question I was raising, which I'd be interested to have your take on, was about the agreement that was reached between the government and COSLA in 2012 or 2013, following the, the government's um, working group and report on instrumental music tuition. Um, they were a bit vague, if I'm honest, about whether they felt that local authorities were still living up to what they'd agreed in 2012 when it comes to instrumental music tuition and what should and shouldn't be done. I wonder, did the government have a view on whether local authorities uh, were, were living up to what they promised? The fact that the committee is having this inquiry and the fact that I've been in discussions with uh, the Music Education uh, Partnership Group and the fact that I've been encouraging local government to participate in the working group that has been set up under the auspices of the Music Education Partnership, which of course includes the government within that, I think is indicative of the fact that I'm concerned about where this whole issue is, is moving to. Uh, I'm concerned about that because I think if there is a diminution in participation in instrumental music tuition, uh, the nature, diversity and opportunity within our education system will be diminished as a consequence. And many of these issues underpinned the consideration that led to the work that was done in 2012-2013 on this question. So I think there is a danger that we are, um, the circumstances that caused concern then are about to reappear in 2018 uh, and for that reason we are uh, taking forward the collaborative approach that we're taking forward. Now there are, there are some careful judgments to be made here because um, as, as members will be aware the government and as I said in my opening remarks the government fully respects the autonomy of local authorities so we want to work with local authorities to try to address these questions uh, to ensure that we do not see any diminution in uh, instrumental music pr provision, which we believe would be detrimental uh, to the well-being of young people in Scotland. 
and, and this relates to the questions that a number of people relate, uh, were, were asking of the last witnesses, but uh, I think an ongoing theme in, in this committee has been particularly about one undertaking that was uh, made in, in 2013, I think it was, by local authorities that we wouldn't see them um, uh, making charges for instrumental tuition that led up to an SQA uh, qualification. Um, I wondered if you had a, a view about, again, whether they were living up to that, um, because uh, a number of witnesses, so people we've had in from the Royal Conservatoire and many others, have raised the question about whether it's, it's practical to ask people to sit and advi advanced higher music if they've been unable to afford the tuition that gets them to a position where they can actually sit that exam uh, from an earlier stage than a year or two before they sit the exam. I think the, on, on the hard question, are local authorities charging young people for instrumental music tuition, which is an integral part of an SQA qualification? Um, I can see no evidence of that happening, with the exception that I am concerned by what I'm seeing in Midlothian Council, which I don't think is consistent with the spirit of that commitment. It may be just about passable in terms of the letter of it, but I don't think it's consistent with the spirit of the, uh, of the, the point that was made in the 2013 report. There is a, a, a different issue, which is about what happens prior to the S4 participation in National 4 and, uh, and uh, in National 5 uh, and uh, other qualifications. Um, and, and that is, I, I think, relates to whether or not accessibility to instrumental music tuition is in any way hindered by the existence of any form of charging which of course gets into the differentiation between the number of authorities that don't charge at all and those who charge something for that and those who charge uh, uh, quite significant amounts. And I think we have to look very carefully at the participation level um, in that respect to ensure that there is no um, obstacle being put in the place of young people from accessing uh, those qualifications as a result of the preparation that they've had beforehand. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Smith, did you want to? Yes, uh, thank you. Can I just follow up, uh, Cabinet Secretary, on, on this issue about SQA uh, qualifications? I agree with you that there are concerns um, in Midlothian. Um, there is obviously a, a difficult issue here because of uh, the purpose to have devolved uh, autonomy for uh, local authorities and indeed for individual schools. But do you accept that um, and given what you've said in previous uh, discussions in both the Chamber and in Committee, that it is, is not appropriate to levy SQA charges on individual families for any SQA exam. Do you accept that? I, I accept that, yes. Yes. And, and therefore, if, if that is the government's um, uh, policy, which I think um, we all agree with, would you be concerned about any circumstance where, particularly for music, which seems to be singled out from uh, other subjects, if a local authority like McGlothian, who claim that they have obviously taken this decision to make the decision one for, for a head teacher, would you be concerned that if there were other cutbacks to be made in that local authority, that there is a possibility that we could end up um, with a decision where a head teacher might, might decide to... Um, place the charge on parents to get that extra money for an SQA exam? That, um, there, there, there feels to me to be quite a lot of hypothetical in there um, uh, for me to, 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 to respond to. Um, I think my point in principle is that I don't think families should be charged for individuals participating in SQA exams. That's my, my point in principle. Um, I think what what the Midlothian example highlights um, is, I think the justification that I've seen from the local authority is that they are providing the discretion for individual schools to decide what is the, 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 the level of participation and therefore to, to, to meet this internal charge. I, I think that needs to be considered within the scope of how much discretion does an individual school have over its finances 
um, because obviously um, the, the significance of that decision on music tuition will be in direct relationship to what is the degree of control the school has over its, its wider finances. And I don't think it will be as wide as I think it would need to be to make that an entirely transparent and reasonable judgment to make. And do you accept that, obviously, um, we've had an awful lot of evidence presented to this committee in the last month or so, where people feel very strongly that music is the poor relation here, that other subjects are not having uh, the same debate, they're not having the same discussion, and that it's that that is creating uh, a sort of inequity and, and, and a feeling that if you really want to pursue music um, in your SQA qualifications, not only do you have to sit these subjects um, with good choice in, in S4, S5, S6, but there is an impact further down the school. Do, do you accept that music has been singled out as having particular difficulties in this respect? I, I, I wouldn't see why that would be the case, uh, given the fact that the broad general education uh, encompasses um, the eight curricular areas, which will include um, the expressive arts and include music within that whole provision. And obviously we look very carefully at the way in which the broad general education is delivered um, across uh, schools to make sure that young people are receiving a holistic education that reflects those eight curricular areas. So I don't, I don't see inherently why that should be the case. Uh, but obviously, if a young person, and, and this relates to my, my response to Dr. Allen a moment ago, uh, these... Well, if a young person has had exposure to instrumental music tuition, that will obviously be of assistance to them in pursuing SQA qualifications at a later stage in the senior phase. Uh, so there is a, a relationship to, uh, in relation to that question, but in terms of the broad general education, uh, I don't see a direct connection that could be applied there. And just my last point, what would you say to one of the uh, trainee music teachers who came to speak to us uh, via the Royal Conservatoire who made the point that for one youngster uh, in a class that they were involved with, that that family had had to make a decision because they, they knew that they weren't going to be able to afford the uh, tuition fees uh, further up the school, so they didn't bother doing anything about music further down the school. Do you accept that that's impacting on the choices that are available to youngsters, particularly if they come from a deprived community? It, it may well have that impact, and that's, that's why we've got to be concerned and anxious about the, the scale and the nature of charges um, where they are levied by some local authorities. Okay, let's go there, please. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up uh, on from uh, Liz Smith's line of questioning, Cabinet Secretary, with regard to the use of selection tests, because I know local authorities across the country, to some extent, and it does vary, uh, look at, and I don't like to use the expression, but it has been suggested that, that they look at aptitude um, as early as primary four to identify whether or not a child should be offered music tuition. Um, and I heard what you were saying in terms of that exposure to musical instruments earlier on will be much more useful to you if you were to pursue a qualification at SQA level later in your uh, academic journey. So um, I'd like to perhaps get your views with regard to the use of selective testing. Um, you know, should it, there be some sort of conformity across the board in terms of when children um, are offered music tuition and what instruments they are offered? I think that would get us into a level of prescription which I think would run at odds with um, the approach to the delivery of, uh, of the curriculum within Scottish education. Um, because I think there will be judgments that will be made by individual schools as to how uh, the, the exposure to instrumental music tuition fits in with the wider curriculum that is taken forward. So I think I would be, I'd be cautious about taking such an approach because I think it would essentially be us applying an approach within education uh, on, on music tuition which is not really reflected in our wider approach to the curriculum. Okay, if I can just jump back then to Ian Gray's line of questioning and um, with regard to exemptions because we've spoken already about <laughs> free school meal entitlement perhaps being used as an exemption and COSLA did accept that it should be the minimum um, but there are variations obviously nationally at certain local authorities offer discounts um, for siblings. Should that then be looked at I suppose as a you know, a national standard with regard to exemptions. Um, 
I am concerned that certain local authorities, for example, write out to parents to advise them as to whether or not um, their child might be entitled to an exemption. Perhaps that's not the best method of communication. Do you have a view with regard to exemptions and that kind of consistency across the board? I think wherever we are, wherever we are applying um, any form of charge, and there may then be an issue of exemptions based on uh, income background, um, or uh, whatever uh, judgments are applied in this respect, I think these issues have got to be handled with great care by individual schools because, as, as I explained in my response to Mr Gray earlier on, uh, I think we've seen in relation to, uh, free uh, to, to the eligibility for free school meals, that can sometimes be something which carries a stigma with it for young people. So th these judgments have got to be handled with great care. Now, when I look at some of the examples of how schools are using pupil equity funding, for example, um, they may be using that funding to provide for particular interventions for all pupils, but there may uh, require to be judgments uh, deployed to take into account the circumstances of individual young people. And I, I see very good practice in how that judgment is arrived at and how that is handled in dialogue with families. And I suppose the, the key to this is the knowledge that schools have of individual families and circumstances, which um, it, to me is a great advantage in enabling schools to make a judgment about how they can sensitively deal with these questions. Thank you. Mr Mandel. Thank you, uh, Convener uh, Cabinet Secretary. You've been very candid in acknowledging the concerns that exist, the concerns that have come before the committee. I just wondered, I mean, there's sort of lots of, of talk of discussing things with, with stakeholders you know, and, and, and moving cautiously. Is there anything you can identify that can be done to, to, to address some of the concerns without, uh, you know, without breaking that balance between local and central government? Yes, I, I think the, the approach that we're, we're trying to take with the, um, with the helpful offer from the Music Education Partnership Group to set up a, a, a specialist group looking at this question, to involve the government and local authorities um, in that group, I think is a really helpful measure because it creates a, a, a space where government can get together with local government and music specialists and people who are really driven by this agenda and um, Professor Wallace's quite clearly very driven by this agenda, and I, I applaud him for his energy uh, on, on, on this matter. And that creates a space where we can perhaps make some progress. Uh, obviously, the Music Education Partnership is, um, is undertaking some research work on this question, and obviously the committee is undertaking its inquiry. And uh, I hope we can draw together these different elements to uh, try to formulate uh, an approach that can be widely supported in ensuring that the objectives that I think we're all interested in achieving can be fulfilled from this process. So are there any specifics that you as Cabinet Secretary would like to see you know, as, as part of whatever emerges? You know, do, do you have an idea of, of what you would like to see and expect to see well, in terms what, of music tuition? What, what I want to see is there being an ability for young people to be able to um, gain access to instrumental music tuition without finance being an obstacle to their participation. And I'm concerned about that issue. Um, and, and a whole number of other questions about the um, availability of skilled uh, professionals, about the opportunities for development, I think we have got very good provision in place. But I am concerned that the issue of uh, cost is... Uh, uh, is potentially an impediment for some young people. Now, what we have already is some local authorities who are taking the view that they will not entertain charges whatsoever. And um, I think that provides a good illustration of, of how this can be taken forward without impediment. And I'm keen to make sure that we um, get to an outcome in which young people are not in any way impeded from participation because of cost. And if we don't get to that point and it's not possible, you know, for local authorities to, to provide that, w what happens then? Well, well, we're, we're prejudging the process that we're currently engaged in and I'm keen to make progress on that question. OK. I'm going to bring in Mr Scott. Yeah. No, thank you. I wonder if I could ask um, you, Cabinet Secretary, if you've received any submissions asking for the £4 million cost of charging across Scotland to be um, covered by the government. 
Uh, I've not, no. Would you would you entertain them if there if there was such well, a submission? Well, obviously, people are free to come to me with uh, with whatever propositions they want, but that's not been, and uh, people are not always uh, well. You, people are not backwards at coming forward at asking me to pay for things, so um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I received them. But I, I'm interested in the uh, you know, some of what I think I saw Mr. Scott questioning Councillor McCabe about earlier on was about the question of um, what might be the arrangements and circumstances for such an approach because um, it was pretty clear um, from Councillor McCabe's ev evidence that um, local government doesn't like ring fencing. Um, so that obviously would have you know, would be a material issue in these conversations. Well, you've preempted a number of my questions, therefore. But I presume <laughs> you'll therefore remove ring fencing on teacher numbers. Well, I think there's uh, actually we have an agreement with local government about boosting teacher numbers, and um, we're very keen for uh, for that to be sustained in the period going forward. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm not sure that's quite how Mr. Councillor McCabe described it, but um, uh, maybe the rather more important question is about the discre discretionary nature of of um, teaching music in our schools. Uh, is the government giving any consideration to whether that service should remain as discretionary or whether there should be a change in status? That, that could well emerge from the discussions that we're having with the Music Education Partnership Group. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, if I'm concerned about the dangers that may lie ahead about levels of participation within instrumental music tuition, I have to be open to considering the question that Mr. Scott raises with me. Uh, if I want to do something about that issue, because I think it would be, I think Scottish education would be the poorer if there was diminished participation in instrumental music tuition, and if we cannot find a way of advancing on that agenda in collaboration, uh, then we, we perhaps might have to look at uh, other approaches. Thank you. Uh, the other uh, yeah, point for completeness, I should also say, and which relates also to my response to Liz Smith, that in the broad general education, there is um, a presumption mm. that young people will have an exposure to music as part of the expressive arts element of the uh, the curricular uh, of the curriculum. Indeed, um, the other point that uh, Councillor McCabe made this morning was that uh, it's not a question of, as he, I think he put it, sticking plaster. It's a, key, a question of core funding for um, local authorities and, and thus for uh, for schools. Do you accept the argument he's making there that? that musical tuition financial support uh, is con is contained at the moment within that structure of local government funding? Yes, because you know, if I go back in the uh, to, to the start of uh, this administration in 2007, I took a decision to remove a great deal of ring fencing of local authority finance. And the purpose of that was to um, enhance, and this was a, an argument which I accepted from local government, which was that this would enhance their spending power because it would remove essentially false barriers within elements of public expenditure. And uh, so the removal of ring fencing gave much more um, capacity for local authority resources to be stretched further because of the way they were able to to draw together different elements of funding rather than having to observe specific constraints and specific requirements of individual ring fences. So the key argument I accepted from local government was that the removal of ring fencing expanded the spending power that local authorities had. Now obviously instrumental music tuition is part of that um, of the block grant, if we call it that, to, to local authorities. And within that, of course, a number of local authorities within the financial constraints with which uh, everybody wrestles are providing instrumental music tuition at no cost uh, to individuals. So some local authorities are, uh, within all these challenges that we all, with which we all wrestle, are able to provide that instrumental music tuition uh, for free. I think I think you read the number who are 
providing free out in your earlier, I think, in your opening statement, and of course the majority are, are not. So is, is this not one of these issues which ultimately is a, is a trade-off? Uh, central government can decide either to fund it or not, and, and what you're saying is you're not going to fund it directly, uh, and indeed the whole government endorsed that. They are not asking for it to be funded directly, thus no ring fencing, and therefore it's going to come down to core funding if they don't have enough core funding, as they see it. Uh, Mr McCabe used the phrase chronic underfunding. Yeah, we, well. I'm not asking you to debate that because we could be all here. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just asking you the principle if there isn't enough core funding, then I don't see how this how music tuition across Scotland improves. Well, but but you know, the, I don't think we can deny or or you know, if we look at okay, in amongst the, the number of authorities that are read out, there are a couple of um, smaller authorities, the Western Isles and 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 Orkney, um, but there are a number of very large authorities that command large sh uh, shares of the population, including. Um, our two largest cities in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and also Dundee, Renfrewshire, one of the largest local authorities in Scotland and Western Bartonshire. So these represent a very significant proportion of pupils around the country being um, uh, having access to. If you don't live there. Well, I, I, I accept that, but and, and that raises issues. You know, when we then look at um, Clackmannan Council, which has got the highest uh, charge of any local authority, mm. it's one of the smallest mainland local authorities, mm. and obviously. Um, the, the, there will be financial challenges that, that exist, but I don't think we can um, just glide past the fact that a very substantial proportion of young people in Scotland are not paying for instrumental music tuition because they are living in these local authority areas who can fund that through the existing local government settlement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr MacDonald, did you want to... My questions have been covered. Really. Oh, okay. Uh, Ms. Lamont? Yeah, um, I don't think we want to rehearse the different arguments on local government finance, but do you at least accept the point that uh, Councillor McCabe made that nobody in local authorities are making these decisions lightly around charging for t tuition? That yeah, they, they're, they're choosing amongst a lot of hard choices, and it's not, um, in their view, not a discrimination against music tuition, it's simply they're having to take hard choices. I'm sure that's the case, yes. And do you also accept that the relationship, you know, you work in partnership with local authorities, but you fund them by 85%. That is not an equal relationship. Um, I, I don't see the relevance of that point. Well, it, it, I think if I was in a room with somebody who's going, I'm relying on for 85% of my funding and I'm making tough choices, then it's not an equal relationship because you're, the local, whatever the Scottish Government, whatever its complexity, or complexion rather, is making decisions around funding which has an impact on local authorities over which they don't have any control. I would have thought that would have been evident. Well, I don't, well, well then, but then why are some of our largest authorities covering the you know, significant proportions of pupil numbers in Scotland able to offer free tuition? Okay, so, you, so your contention is that this is not about funding, it is simply about um, different attitudes to, to music tuition. If that's the case, and I agree with you that Glasgow has, has, doesn't charge, my own family has benefited from it immensely, and I'm very proud of what has, has been done successfully over many years in Glasgow. But Chris Cunningham, the education convener, when he came here, said that local government had disproportionately been affected by decisions around um, cut, cut budgets, and that while, yes, they were funding tuition, certainly since I got, they believed that there was consequences elsewhere. So they are making there are consequences uh, to funding free hmm. tuition for music uh, in some local authorities around the other choices that they're making. Yeah, I, I think that you know John Lamont prefaced our, our first question to me by saying we weren't going to rehearse local government finance, and we're just about to rehearse local government finance because I think local you know, we've we've faced very difficult financial choices as a government uh, since 2010 as a consequence of the sustained austerity that's been applied to the Scottish budget. And uh, as part of our response to that, I think we've treated local government fairly. And in that context, I think local government has had to um, endure um, disproportionately no more challenge than the Scottish government has had to endure. And within that, a, a number of authorities, including some of our largest authorities, are able to pay for free instrumental music tuition. So I think um, th there are choices being made and I think what's important is that we, um, we, we don't simply say that the answer to that must be for the government to provide 
more resources to local government in general because some local authorities are attaching a greater priority to this service than others? Well, your own Chris Cunningham, who's the education convener in Glasgow, said that he believed local authorities were disproportionately affected by cuts. You have made that choice. I don't understand why you don't simply own that choice and say you've chosen to, to, to make the decision to provide around financing. And Cosla and others are saying, as a consequence, they're having to make tough decisions. Some local authorities are targeting um, music tuition. Others are doing other things. But can I maybe move on to this issue about... Um, whether music is seen as a different subject from other subjects. Is there a view at Scottish Government level on the curriculum? What are the obligations around subjects that must be available within secondary schools? Um, the, 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 the design of Curriculum for Excellence is structured around um, eight curricular areas. Um, there is um, a, an expectation set out of the experience that young people uh, should receive as part of the broad general education, which will include exposure to music education as part of uh, the experience that young people have up to the conclusion of S3 um, as part of the broad general education. Um, and that's you know, very clearly distilled by advice from Education Scotland. And in my view, um, the participation in music is a critical part of enabling young people to do what Curriculum for Excellence is aimed to achieve, which is to, um, to, to, to deliver the four capacities of Curriculum for Excellence, which um, uh, are about ensuring we support young people to become, um, uh, to equip young people for the world in which they I just they, wonder they whether face. you monitor what's happening, for example, in secondary schools, about the range of subjects that are offered to young people. So um, we don't want, of course, we want young people to have the opportunity in music. We might want, we could argue they should have the opportunity to study geography, history, modern studies. Mm -hmm. I think the evidence might suggest that the subject choices are narrowing, and I wonder if that is at least something that you monitor. We, uh, we, we look very carefully at the delivery of the broad general education, which, as I say, exists until um, uh, the completion of S3, and then obviously we... Uh, we look at the range of qualifications that are achieved by young people and what we see is a pattern of um, rising attainment as a consequence of young people's participation in the senior phase but of education. You can have a rise in attainment and a narrowing of subjects, uh, which will narrow your opportunities at a later stage. Can I ask you, finally, really this question round that, that's been prompted by the suggestion that you devolve decision-making to um, head teachers? Um, I think Midlothian suggesting that you would devolve that to school and they can decide whether they're going to make music tuition accessible or not, and some people would be concerned about that. Under your model of devolving more power to head teachers, could you see a situation where a head teacher might say, we want to be a centre of expertise in music or drama or something else, and therefore we actively are choosing not to invest in one particular bit of the curriculum in order to make us a specialist in expertise in another. Under your model of giving very significant powers to head teachers, could that happen? And as a consequence, under the, the model um, perhaps being uh, pursued by Midlothian, you could see a situation where a head teacher could say, I'm not going to offer music tuition, I'm going to use the money in something else. No, because we expect the, uh, the, the, the model of empowered schools that I'm taking forward um, is set within the framework of Curriculum for Excellence, which puts that requirement on schools uh, to ensure that young people have a broad general education that supports the uh, objectives a, and aims of Curriculum for Excellence. It wouldn't put a requirement in the head teacher to ensure that everybody could be offered advanced higher music, though. But that doesn't exist today. So, well, either we're empowering head teachers or we're not. It seems to me we're well, both empowering we're, well, we are. And I just wondered whether the model at Midlothian is, is looking or exploring is something that would be perhaps easier under your model of giving more powers to head teachers. It, no, well, the, the, what I think the, the question that arises, which I rehearsed with, uh, I think, in my response to Liz Smith about the Midlothian model, is what degree of financial um, flexibility uh, and over what degree of resources does the head teacher have control? And I'm sceptical that the head teacher in that model has uh, extensive control over finances within the school. 
um, because they are essentially what it looks to me as if as if um, a, a, a an internal charge is essentially being passed to a school without the commensurate degree of financial uh, scope and flexibility that I think mm -hmm. should that, but well, your, that, preferred that, that model, your preferred model would be for the head teacher to have more authority and control. That's absolutely that. correct, yes. And therefore right. if that head teacher then decided not to invest in um, the music tuition it would require for a young person to advance higher or higher music, that would be acceptable to you? That no, would be no, about no, devolving no, decision making? No, it wouldn't because of my earlier answer which is that we expect um, we will expect head teachers under the model that I'm taking forward to deliver the full range of curriculum that is envisaged under curriculum for excellence. I think it's impossible for it to be both things at once, but there you go. Um, Ms. McKay, did you yes. want to yeah. um, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if I could have your view on the option of uh, music tuition being delivered through a national agency or perhaps moving towards the Finnish model where I think there's about 89 uh, sub government subsidised music schools and music tuition is mandatory in, in primary schools. That is that something for down the line? I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit reluctant about um, uh, the creation of a, of a new national agency to, uh, to deliver music education, uh, music education tuition. Um, I think I, 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 I don't really see what... I don't think that's actually the problem we've got here. I think we've got, you know, we've got capacity and capability within the education system to provide um, instrumental music tuition. Um, I think the type of model of a national agency as Kai raises with me is something that would essentially be established to address a weakness in that respect, which I don't think exists. Um, in relation to um, the question of centres of excellence, I, I, again, I'm, I think there are some, we've taken some decisions over time to recognise a particular individual um, if, a particular focus that would exist in a certain limited number of schools around the country to develop expertise in this area. But I am interested in making sure that across the education system there is a, a participation within um, and an exposure to um, music education which is available to all young people. And I think it's an important, that's an important characteristic of the service that we have today and something that should be maintained in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, can I pick up a couple of points with you, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Um, we had a, a, um, a discussion with Cosland and we've talked about them not liking ring fencing. And uh, But the Youth Music Initiative strikes me as um, a, a project where the policy objectives of the government have been met with with the partners of, who are delivering in COSLA and it works very well and we, we heard nothing but praise for the YMI so do you think there are mechanisms that can be used to achieve a policy objectives working with COSLA? I think that's an example of uh, the collaborative approach which uh, I think can be successful and um, it's certainly something that uh, is worth exploring as part of the uh, the working group in which we're both participating. Okay. And um, Finally, um, we heard a lot about the sustainability and the, the idea of a tipping point at the moment um, in terms of the precarious nature of music going forward because of the pressures. And um, in meeting the, the young people from the conservatoire, um, there were a couple that had come through the Glasgow um, schools and had been uh, exposed to their music through that, but had also every one of them had had to have additional funding through a bursary to cover grades, to cover um, access to, um, I think it was the, the Young Conservatoire group or or other projects that they were involved in. And um, every single one of the young people we spoke to from whatever background, whatever school, had had to have additional training, um, particularly around the area of piano, which they needed to, to be be able to form at grade eight to access the conservatoire to become music teachers um but we, we heard that that piano is an instrument that isn't we're unaware of it being taught anywhere other than through privately and, and things so um do do you have a concern that um the curriculum is supporting people who have an aspiration to become music teachers in our state schools we certainly have to make sure that the curricular experience is sufficiently broad to make sure young people can uh, can access these pathways uh, into higher education and um, so I'm certainly you know if, if there are specific areas where there are impediments to that uh, I'm certainly very happy to explore them. 
Okay, and I think Ms Gilruth wants some to it, Just as a brief supplementary to Rona Mackay's line of questioning with regard to this being perhaps developed at a national level, I wonder if there's maybe an opportunity with regard to the regional improvement collaboratives to look at how this could be driven forward with regard to um, consistency of provision and sharing good practice at a local level? Undoubtedly, there's an opportunity to do that, and the regional improvement collaboratives have been established and are making um, uh, good progress and significant impact within the education system, because what they are about is sharing expertise and good practice uh, to enhance provision in individual uh, schools uh, around the country. So I think undoubtedly there's an opportunity for uh, such collaboration to assist in overcoming some of the challenges that we face here. Thank you. thank you. Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much for your attendance this morning and to Mr Pentland as well. And uh, We're about to go into private session, but before we do so, as this is our last public meeting, we wish everyone the very best for the festive season going forward. And we now move into private session.